Welcome to the View Magazine's Rebel Justice Podcast. This is the second and last part of this episode from our Someone's Daughter podcast series. In today's episode, we'll continue to talk about how governments oppress women who speak out and how the current criminal system can be extremely flawed towards women. Today's panel includes Alba Duke, a Spanish artist and photographer who mainly works in women's subjects, David Shaw, a lawyer from InstaLaw who specializes in civil actions against public authorities, and Shivali Patel, an activist who works in animal rights, mistreatment of workers, and also in the BLM campaign. This talk was hosted by The View magazine's Claire Barstow, an activist and woman with lived experience. Thank you, Claire. You know, I've done work with the Freedom Association and particularly to do with genital mutilation. And I mean, that some of the women, well, it was very frightening for a lot of the women to talk out. And particularly women in prison who've undergone that. You can imagine that, you know, trying to survive and then going through the trauma of prison. I mean, it, again, it's, it's these really difficult situations that don't get highlighted because, you know, the ruling classes aren't interested. They just want to keep things separate. So what do you think is the solution, David, to try and rectify and try and bring women, encourage women to speak out? What do you think, what laws need to be in place and what changes in society need to be made from your perspective? It's a big one. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer that. I suppose from from a sort of um, legal point of view, greater equality laws. Um, we have the Equality Act, but it's what well, something that some, a lot of people don't realise about the Equality Act is for some reason. Um, I don't know if anyone has heard about limitation periods for claims. So, for instance, if you if you trip over and you break your arm, you've got three years to put in a claim. Um, if you want to, but if you want to challenge a a decision of a public body by way of judicial review, you have three months. And if you want to bring a claim under the Equality Act, um, you only have six months to issue a claim. And now part of the problem is, especially for women prisoners, this will be a problem, is getting access to legal advice, getting access to a lawyer, getting legal aid. There's so many barriers put in place that make those, make, makes enforcing those rights and very difficult. Um, so that would be that would be one start, you know, from the legal perspective, that making sure that those periods are more reasonable, and um, making legal aid more available so that people do, especially. So I suppose from thinking from my perspective as you know a prison lawyer, making it so that women in prison do have the ability to challenge the rights. And then I suppose one one thing would be if if you've got women in prison who feel they can't speak out because of, you know, retribution, it might be that there's a, a system whereby um, the person who's dealing with the complaints isn't aware of the um, prisoner's um, name and number um, so that they can look at it without having any comeback. I know that might be difficult to implement, but it's um, off the top of my head. That might be something where there's, they don't have that retribution, then they might feel a bit more safe doing it that way, or more sort of culpability, or sort of so it's more accountability for if something does happen to the woman afterwards. So if the if the female prisoner puts in a complaint, and then they are shipped out of the prison, an explanation's got to be given, or if something does happen to them afterwards, because if there was that accountability. Um, and they couldn't just move prisoners, you know, at the drop of a hat. And prisoners had a right to be near to their family. Then that that would that would probably give them some reassurance that they could speak up and um, enforce the rights. But I don't. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure that answers your question. Sort of yeah. from my sort of point of view, it's probably just some things that on that could be put in place quite easily that mm. could level the playing field a little bit. But Society wide, I'm not. I think obviously what you guys are doing is great. I'm not sure what what I could suggest wholesale. Um, I think that was so powerful, especially the part where you talk about the equality and like even the time to put in a yeah. response for that. 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I took Durham prison. Well, we were going to take Durham prison to court because the men got full time education and the women didn't. Um, and in the end, we didn't have to get to court. They they kind of backed down um, because it went in the some of the newspapers and they, the women did eventually get the full time education. But it, you know, it, it is a lot harder because yeah, again, you're not getting access to the same facilities as men. And sometimes, it, as I say, I mean, I I stood to lose a lot, and I've and I mean, I did actually, I suppose in a way, get moved to a different prison, which I did want to, but then it worked in my favour because you know, I didn't want to be there. I wanted to be further south, so being moved to the way prison was a bit more beneficial to me. But at least the women who left, well, I left behind did get the full-time education. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's totally why that like, women won't speak out and won't say anything because of those reasons, you know. And I think, as I say, regarding the, you know, the corporate world, it should be almost mandatory that some of these Big global companies have more women representatives on the board and have more women, you know. I mean, they should. I was a member of the 300 campaign to get 300 women into parliament in, in the nine, in about 1978 79, and there's still only 100 women in parliament just mm-hmm. over. So it's still, you know, there's still a, a tremendous inequality. I mean, how do you feel chivalry about that the fact that there is? such a major imbalance and and what improvements would you suggest if you had the chance to voice something that maybe could make a difference I feel as though even having um that label of being a criminal for doing something that is out of trauma or out of pain it just shouldn't be on there should be a proper way of really taking the time compassionately to see whether or not that person has challenges in their life in their relationships what their upbringing was like what the life circumstances before just giving them that label of here you did this thing and that's what you're going to be um that's that's what's going to determine how you're treated from now on if people are treated as if they need care and actually given that care um, and that love then there can be a completely different outcome to their life to their families' lives and to society in general. And it could be such a different story. We wouldn't even have to be protesting about anything at that point because it's just you're actually treating that person as if they are a real human with emotional needs. And empathy is the thing that I would like to see more and just not actually humanising the people that are in the prisons rather than just even having a system that creates such a strong label around somebody's identity because that's what is really toxic and yeah it's a big it's a big change but I really do believe that having that money reinvested rather than currently it's being invested in creating more spaces for women in prison but if that money that was being used to do that was actually used to create some kind of care plan and an actual pilot of trying to create this new rehabilitating system uh, where the people are cared for and even tested out with a few people, then that would be a lot better. And then that could be used as a model to create that new system rather than, and to yeah move things along a lot quicker and actually testing that, which I'm sure is going to be a vast improvement anyway, because putting somebody in a cell isn't exactly going to make any difference they'll have all that time to reflect but it'll also drive them crazy and it will break down their family structures which is one of the biggest things that you can possibly do to create a re-offending individual because um, relationships being broken down within families is the cause of most criminal activities yes very well said because it's very true Yeah, and on an international perspective, Alba, do you think there should be some kind of global bill of rights for women, that there should be some kind of thing that where people in every country should have basic rights? Do you feel that they're they're not getting? I mean, of course, as you said before, there are still kids who, girls who are being, um, how's the name, circumcision, so imagine, right, or, well, I don't know. Um, so, yes, of course, it should be some, well, it's humans' rights, right? So it 
should be something global because it, it doesn't make any sense to me that depending on where you are, you your rights are less or more basic as that. But I really don't, I, I, I'm not entitled to talk about particular in prisons because I'm not that close no. to the penal system. About women in the community, what rights do you think women should have to better protect them and to encourage them to speak out and also you know, to make sure that they are being treated equally, even though the law might say what basic rights do you think there should be there? I think it's like more than basic rights. I think it's the whole system, how the whole system is built. So, um, for example, for me, uh, it should be very, very important that the system is built, built equally by men and women, right? So, so we can start seeing what our rights or our need or or our needs are. So if women start um, occupying power positions in, in society, in criminal system, in politics, um, I think it will like naturally become more equal, right? What doesn't make sense is that we think how men um, with higher like power positions should uh, give us rights, you know? Yeah, it's like laws are almost imposed upon us by by the largely white male class. High class, I would say. High classes, yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. And upper classes, yeah. I think, you know, there is still quite... A, the class system in this country is still pretty strong, and even though it might have improved to some extent, it always feels that, you know, as soon as it makes improvement, it sometimes falls back down again. Do you think there should be more encouragement for people access to arts and and culture? Do you think that's really important? A more diverse audience could be encouraged to get to access because sometimes through arts and culture can also bring change. Um, Do you think that, again, if if there was more incentive and encouragement for people of diverse backgrounds to go and make it more accessible, do you think that's the way forward? Me. Of course, and I think it's super related of what uh, she really said about, um, I think art is a very powerful tool and weapon when it comes to emotional healing or emotional um, caring for both the people who's making it and for like the, the audience or who's seeing it, right? So... Absolutely, and I think you're you're even lucky here because in Spain, artists really struggle because it's 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 something like it's not that much supported, right? We don't really have a lot of spaces in which art is done or is welcome. So of course, there's always people willing to to express themselves or, or to do things. So this is not gonna stop from us to do it, but. We then we really struggle in order to do it or to live from it or to have the spaces for doing it properly. So, hundred percent, I think it would help. Yeah, I suppose a lot of the the local authorities and the government. I mean, there, there are some free gallery spaces here where people can access, but there's also a lot where you have to pay quite exorbitant amounts of money to go and see exhibitions and certain exhibitions. And I think that can be quite, um, that's not very inclusive. How do you feel about that, Shirley? Do you think that could be a way forward through art and through, you know, inspired by the exhibition, how if more people could see it and people who couldn't afford it could go at a, a, a lower cost? Do you think that would be better, maybe have free spaces available? Yeah, I think accessibility is really important for people in low socioeconomic groups and uh, people that are marginalised. And also when it comes to things like um, art and culture, I feel like, yeah, it's definitely a great healing modality, as Alba mentioned, and um, people being able to express themselves and create things um, that can be felt, but they can express their own feelings and start to process those. That's really powerful for the individual um, and especially in prisons as well. I feel like these should definitely be things that are accessible in prisons as well. 
so the women in prison can actually uh, have a way to have an outlet for everything that they're going through in there as well. But also going back to something else that Alba mentioned earlier, uh, with the having women in power in politics, one big thing that I see as a glaring issue is the fact that the richest people in the world are white men. And um, there's something called lobbying, where laws can, I'm not sure, David probably knows a bit more about lobbying than I do. But essentially, if you have a lot of money, you can influence the law and the policies. So no matter what you vote for, no matter what you ask your MP for, um, whatever you do, if someone has enough money and they don't like that movement happening, they can just pay for a law to kind of bypass the vote or the people's voice in that way. So I'm not sure, maybe David could elaborate a bit more on that, but I think lobbying is something that I would, I don't know if there's a way to kind of stop that so people can genuinely get what they ask for. Yes, that's a very good point. David, how do you think that could be rectified? Because it is a a serious issue and there's there's sparks of corruption in some ways. Yeah, I mean, I don't actually know a lot about lobbying, um, but I know that it's obviously you can you have professional lobbyists, don't you? Get paid a certain yeah. amount of money per year to go and lobby, which is try and convince MPs to do to go one way on a certain issue or not. Um, whether that should be whether you should ban, you know, professional lobbyists because you're always going to have like, if if you contact an MP and ask them to do something then is that would that be classed as lobbying or would that just be classed as contacting your MP so I think what sort of Shivali was talking about is like the sort of professional side of it because if you're a multinational corporation you've got sort of billions of pounds behind you you can afford to pay a lot of people to lobby MPs whereas if you're just you know on your own activist or a very sort of grassroots level probably going to find it a lot more difficult so there probably needs to be some laws. I think that obviously there must there are lobbying laws, whether they are working or not is a different issue, isn't it? So for example, there's a law that says, okay, we'll only allow a hundred chemicals into this container that's going to be fed to this many people. Um if there's a company with a lot of money, they can just easily be like, Okay, we're gonna allow that to happen. But if if it's done based on the number of people that have voted for that as an individual policy or law or say for example even with the bill being passed if there's enough people that say no to that then surely that should be enough for it to not happen yeah so more votes to sort of individuals rather than delegating it to mps so more more like um, been in sort of ancient greece although i don't think there was any i don't think they allowed women to vote in called up anyway but you know what i mean Especially yeah, with technology I think, I think now. That, well, it'd be very easy, wouldn't it? It's, if they if they can track everybody on an iPhone for COVID, or you know, if we all have to have COVID passports, then it'd be very easy to turn that into a mechanism to vote on certain things as well, wouldn't it? Yeah, you could just have. And then you could have a phone. referendum on every law. Well, you, yeah, you wouldn't yeah. even you wouldn't need an MP. Well, you need you could have MPs who go and debate, mm. and then we just we vote at the end of it. So the yeah. MPs don't vote; all the individuals vote. A lot of European countries have a lot more referendums than we do. Some of them have, you know, almost every month on certain things. And it seems like it was more the the origin of democracy, the Greek city-states. It was, you know, at least everybody, uh, men and no slaves weren't allowed to have a vote either. But the whole idea of of where people could, could vote, I mean, it would make it more accessible and it would make it where people would feel that they did have a say because a lot of people feel that feel that they don't and they're you know all they're scared to, to say about certain things then maybe if it was more private but you could still vote then yeah I think it, it could be a way forward and in talking about access to yeah I mean obviously access to education for women in prison is isn't the same uh, as as for men because of the fact that this is a much smaller minority um do you think there's a way that access to art and culture and different things and access to drawing materials access to writing materials could be improved in in prisons do you think there's a way of protecting that David how do you feel about that is there anything that could be done 
I'm not sure what what the state of play is in terms of access to art in, in prisons. I know when when I've visited a lot of prisons, you do see art on the walls, but I don't know how prevalent that is. You know, is that across the estate that they allow it, um, or is it only a certain number of prisoners because they only get a certain amount of funding for it? I'm not sure if, but from your experience, yeah. what is that? Yeah, a, a lot of the money was earmarked that used to be for art in prison was earmarked for basic education because there was a a real thing on basic skills. So a lot of the a lot of the other classes like music, art, creative writing, you know, got cancelled. In fact, you know, I used to work in the library and I used to run creative writing classes in the library. And I used to I started up a lot of magazines and encouraged women to write through that, but that was me doing it. And obviously I was only, you know, a few and far between of us who who would do that. A lot of people didn't get access and particularly you know, women, because there was less of them, whereas there was a lot of life of jails for men, long term, mm. specifically, there was, you know, the education in, the, in those establishments was a brilliant and quite a high standard. But obviously, you know, women suffered because of that, because there was, um, and there wasn't really, you know, things that were, were cut back, the, the creative stuff that can make women think and make women talk speak out and maybe say something do you think that there's a way that things could be encouraged in prison in the future to help women in that way yeah I think it's probably a funding issue isn't it by the sounds of it or maybe policy issue um, and yeah. that probably needs to be addressed at the national level um I think that one of one of the issues is you know a lot of the prison funding been cut and cut and cut and so if you're going to have um, you know, if you've if you're if you're a prison governor and you're looking at your budget and you're thinking, well, I've my budget's been cut. Um, I need to make sure that there's first and foremost everybody's safe because if I don't, I'm going to get sued. And so you're probably going to prioritise that over over and above you know the art and all the rest of it. So I think part of it is going to be the funding issue, isn't it? So prisons need to be better funded, and then um, you can then look at these. Um, you know, art and things like that. Yeah, I think it's the, the the state of a lot of the prisons is just awful at the moment. I think, you know, violence is on the rise, dilapidation in a lot of the prisons. So it's, it's um, yeah, I think it's funding would go a long way, I think, and then obviously policy change. And probably there's not a, a lot of awareness that that's a, a need as well. Mm. Do you think by employing more experts through experience in the Ministry of Justice and in other bodies that maybe highlight the things that are really needed? Because I think a lot of the other officials can't see that. Um, maybe if they employed more experts through experience throughout and in the prison system, do you think that could be a way forward? Yeah, I think so. And I think one of because I've read somewhere that a lot of one of the issues was that when I think when when the when the cuts started to come in during the sort of from 2010 onwards, they weren't recruiting, or they weren't recruiting, they, they weren't replacing like for like. So you would lose, you know, a very senior officer um, who might retire, for example, um, but they weren't replacing. They weren't getting other people with similar experience to get somebody in who's got no experience. So. Whereas when when I started, because um, I've I've represented prisons in the past as well as done um, as well as acting for prisoners, and we had we had a lot of people with experience from other other parts of um, society. So like if they've been in the army or the navy or the air force, and then transferred or, or even the police and transferred over into the prisons. Um, whereas now I think it's a lot of people who because you can't get the numbers through the doors. Because the wages are so low, and you know, you, you find you're getting people with no experience. So a lot of the prisoners that I speak to say that the, the, the prison officers just don't know what they're doing. I mean, I know that's anecdotal coming from prisoners, but they're, they're the people who are on the ground. And some of these people that tell me this are you know people who've been who've been in, in the system for twenty years, and it's mm-hmm. they so they've seen it how it was, you know, before I was even in practice, and then that they're seeing it now and telling me that that that's one of the issues so um i think you're right i think it is bringing in people from outside not just and i mean it would help with it with the art side but also just more fundamentally um if you've lost a lot of the expertise and the you know the, from seniority and i think this was an issue with the 
lot of police forces as well due to austerity. But so that would go a long way to, to help. I think they brought more more people in with experience. And I know there's a lot of there's quite a lot of retired governors who um, do act as like consultants and things like that. Um, but yeah, so I think you're right. Yeah, and those with lived experience, you know, it's so important to be able to to have that understanding and to and to know and to be able to highlight changes that maybe not be seen by somebody, you know, on the other side of the fence, as it were, maybe. Yeah, I think that would tell, um, because I suppose from if you've been on that side of it, you can explain to the people who who haven't been there, you know, what why why things would go wrong, because like like the riots in Birmingham. In, in the Birmingham prison is because it was so sort of if you read the report from that that because the the prison was under so much pressure because staffing issues and all the rest of it and the, the prisoners that all kicked off basically because prisoners couldn't get access to the medication that day and so some prisoners it was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back and it led to them sort of protesting and um, and then led to the riots and that again it would have been a, a sort of funding issue mm. Okay, so do you think funding and well, money in a way, putting money into worthwhile projects and projects that are out of the norm, do you think that is a way, that, you know, and some of the charities, do you think that is a way of maybe trying to make a difference and, and encourage people to speak out in an effective way and, and, and you know obviously rioting is it's tough I understand it can it can happen um but maybe being able to pro yeah I mean obviously you can't really even protest in prison even being a, a, a silence protest isn't allowed so um but do you think that could be a way forward of trying to improve things is funding the bodies that need it yeah yeah probably I suppose you'd start ground level with the prisons and like you were saying bring in it, it would be great if they brought in other um like if they reinvested in the arts and stuff like that that'd be great but i suppose i suppose more better training for staff so um especially with conflict resolution because from what what i see i mean i know obviously I, i'm dealing with probably the top percentage of the worst sort of incidents because they're the ones that come to us but I see a lot of cases where a prisoner might be disgruntled about something and remonstrating with staff. And rather than trying to de-escalate the situation as they should be trained to do in accordance with the sort of prison service instructions and orders that are in place, you see staff moving to use of force quite quickly. And then obviously things escalate then. And um, so that would be one thing. It's more, more training of staff. I also think greater and wider use of body worn cameras because what what I tend to find is that um in the case that I deal with body worn cameras are turned on part way through an incident um body worn camera footage goes missing there's there's no central log in some prisons for body worn camera and body worn camera footage isn't kept for a very long time so if a prisoner is assaulted um, by staff the prison don't have to keep it for any set, you know, period of time. So the question query whether they could have body worn cameras on, you know, as soon as if a prisoner starts remonstrating, they put the body worn camera on straight away so that it protects the prisoners protected them from any, you know, unlawful use of force. Yeah. There's lots of things I think they could do that probably wouldn't cost money that would improve rights in prisons. Well, yeah, that's all we can hope for. So finally, to finish off if everybody could come up with one thing in particular they would like to see change that could improve people's right to to speak out, that could encourage it. Is there anything in particular that you feel that could be in place, uh, Shivali? Um, For the women in prison who are um, being systematically oppressed, I think having that transparency, so with the cameras, like a really robust system of cameras, maybe ones that don't just delete themselves after a few seconds, something that is stored that can protect them and and be accessed by their family members or anyone outside who, yeah, there, there needs to be transparency. Um, and to have things that actually prevent, people don't just 
start protesting and get violent in prisons for no reason. The behavior of violence comes mm. from not being heard, not having forms of expression. So these arts and cultural healing modalities need to be part of the structure, not something that is optional or uh, it has to be part of the structure. The structure just doesn't, it doesn't work anyway to have a, a prison called a prison and people labeled as criminals. But if that is still going to be there, then these things need to be an integral part of their care or their stay there because otherwise you do lose your marbles and you do end up wanting to just lash out because why how much can someone take how much dehumanizing can someone take before they just don't have any yeah sense of care anymore that must have been awful the fact that they would even risk staying Mm. in there for longer and Mm. being away from their families longer because that's how much crap they've had to put up with to that point where that's even something they're considering yeah that's very powerful and very strong how about you Alba is there something that you feel that could be in place one thing in particular you'd like to see change to help women on a international level even to to be able to feel comfortable to speak out and 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 rebel um I don't think I'm able to say like one particular thing, but well, as I'm saying, I guess when there's a representation of real population in all levels, oppression can't be reproduced just the same, which is once among others, right? So I guess that would be it, like real. And, and I think I'm we're getting there, right? First, feminism, Black Lives Matters, and everything like real representation of. All, the whole population at all levels. Yeah, and how about you, David? You said you mentioned that. Is there anything in particular that you think? What well, just one thing? Do you think everything you've mentioned? But if there was just one thing that you that strikes you as the most important thing, maybe that could be changed. I think, from a, a legal perspective, um, it would be greater access to legal aid. Legal aid's been eroded. Um, quite a lot um, just since I've been in practice. Um, So since 2013, legal aid was reduced quite significantly. I think if we went um, back, even if we went back to pre-2013 levels, that would be a great uh, leap for access to justice. Um, I suppose on a more sort of wide level, it would be greater sort of representation of um, individuals at at the parliamentary level. Um, by that I mean more referendums um, or sort of direct sort of direct votes on things that would affect us all because I think you'd probably find that a lot of things wouldn't get through Parliament then. It goes goes back probably to what Shivali was saying before about lobbying. Yeah. And uh, that that would I think but I can't see that ever happening, but that would be a massive sea change in sort of liberal democracies going forward if that was to happen. Yes, yeah, but no, I think legal legal aid is a real issue because I yeah I've been a part of them marches for legal aid to raise funds for legal aid through the Howard League before. Um, so yeah, I I think that is a is also a big issue because people aren't getting because there isn't the funding. A lot of cases get turned down because they, you can't get legal aid, and so unless you get legal aid, nothing can be said. But anyway, I'd just like to thank everybody. Um, uh, the whole panel for taking part it's been really um interesting discussion and i hope uh, you've all enjoyed it too and hopefully um you know this can be one of maybe other panels going forward in the future thank you very much for your time claire alba david and shivali and for sharing with us your insights and your experiences related to whether you feel that governments try to oppress women who speak out This brings to a close the second and last part of today's episode, a discussion that focused on changing the way we perceive the rights of women who want to make a stand for themselves in the current criminal justice system. Our system is flawed. The lack of response from the police and a shortage of essentials in women's prisons are just a few indications of that. Someone's Daughter is an insightful photography exhibition which brings together world-leading photographers to take portraits of women campaigners, survivors, activists, and high-profile leaders. 
You can go online and search for Someone's Daughter to see how this campaign represents women who have lived experience in the criminal justice system. You can also read our stories on The View magazine and be inspired by these shocking narratives, but also by the constructive solutions. Thank you for listening.